Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to invite you to open in your New Testament to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 That's where we'll take our study from this morning. Glad to see everyone here. Uh, you know, may not be beautiful outside, may have had a few bumps along the way in getting here, but we're glad you're here. This morning when I, I first stepped out of bed, uh, I took my first step on my right foot, and it, it felt like it does when you tweak your ankle. You know, I uh, thought, I literally have been laying in bed for hours, and I didn't go to bed with a t twisted ankle. I'm not sure what had just happened here. I have some theories about it, and I don't like any of them, but... Took a little while to warm up this morning. I don't know how your day's gone, but I'm glad you've taken the time to come together today and to worship the Lord. You know, the, the public life of Jesus, what we typically refer to as his public ministry, lasted for about three and a half years, not terribly long in the whole scheme of things. And uh, each of those, you know, years was kind of roughly divided into equal sections. During the first year or so, about 14 months actually, things seem to have been kind of quiet during that first period of time. There's not much recorded actually in the Gospels that come from that period of time. During the, the second year or so of his public ministry, Jesus was actually very popular with the people. Uh, it's during that time that you read a lot in the, in the Gospels about great crowds following Jesus. You know, it's the occasions when he, you know, can't get a, you know, can't go uh, anywhere for lack of, you know, a, a crowd, you know, there's a crowd always around him at that point. And the third year, although there's still a lot of crowds around Jesus, that third year is where you see a lot of opposition. The Jewish leaders are questioning him, they are trying to cause problems for him, and that opposition, of course, would ultimately lead to the cross. Well, the events that we're going to talk about this evening are going to take place during that third year. And by this point in time, here in Matthew chapter 16, you already have the, the death of John the Baptist. He's already been put to death by this point. The, Jesus has already had several confrontations with the Jewish leaders. You know, they are questioning his every move and every statement it is already by this point we've come to what we read about in John chapter 6 where Jesus had given that great sermon on the fact that he is the bread of life. And then we find at the end of that chapter in verse 66 that many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. I mean, they just turned around and walked away. And I wouldn't be surprised if the apostles had maybe a few questions based on the way things were going. From a worldly perspective, things were not going very well. And the truth is, the ride was kind of rough, and really it was only going to get worse from that point. Things were going to continue to go downhill all the way till they got to the cross. And it seems to me that, that Jesus, knowing that the time was coming near, I mean, you're within a year at this point, he at various points will take the disciples away. He'll take them away from everything that was going on primarily in Galilee, and he will give them very personal instruction. That's what he's going to do here in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus takes his disciples away from all that had been happening. He took them up to the district of Caesarea Philippi, up north of the Sea of Galilee, and he did that so that he might help them with some things that they would have to have straight in their minds if they were ever going to be the men that he had called them to be as his apostles. And so I want us to, to read a little bit from Matthew chapter 16, read the passage, and then we're going to talk about a couple of things that we can learn from what is said there. Uh, these are things that we have to have fixed in our minds as well, these things that Jesus wanted to teach the apostles. And so in Matthew chapter 16, if you begin in verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would lose his life, or whoever would save his life, rather, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit, or what will it profit a man, if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man come. Well, did I mess that up? No, come. Until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right. End of the reading. There are a couple of things that I want us to see as we look at these verses from the end of, of Matthew chapter 16. And the first thing that I want you to see from this chapter is the importance of recognizing the identity of Jesus. That's what we begin with here from about verse 13 through the first you know, several verses. Now, this is not the first time that the disciples have recognized that Jesus was the Christ. Unless I'm mistaken, they, they believe that really pretty much from the beginning. And they had made that known already by this point. For example, back in the early parts of the Gospel of John, John chapter 1 and, and verse 41, when Andrew first came and told his brother Peter about Jesus, he would say to him there in John 1, 41, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Same, same concept. But this confession of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 16 is, is a little different. It's more significant because it came at a time when the disciples were very likely discouraged, when they were maybe disappointed with the way things were going. They had no doubt thought about all of the things that that seemed to them to be going wrong, all of the people who just walked away, all of the the questioning and and the problems that the Jewish leaders were were causing. All of those things, no doubt, would have been going through their minds. And I wouldn't be shocked if they had even begun to entertain some doubts, maybe just creeping in. You know, good people can have doubts. For example, I I think John the Baptist had his doubts for a period of time. He is the one in John chapter 1 and verse 29 who would say of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one who would make that statement. But he is also the one who, after being thrown into prison, would send some of his disciples in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 3 to Jesus and have them ask the question, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? That doesn't seem to go together, does it? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are you the one? And what that says to us is things look different sometimes in the midst of trouble. I think that's what was going on there. There was practically no end to the alternatives that could have influenced the thinking of the disciples. Uh, That may be why Jesus began by asking them, what do other people say? You know, he wanted to know what they had heard. And there were a lot of different, you know, a lot of different theories about Jesus. And there were a lot of wrong theories about Jesus. Some people believed that Jesus was John the Baptist. We know that Herod did. I mean, Herod had put him to death. And he thought he, he, was, he was John the Baptist come back from the dead. That was probably just his guilty conscience, you know, coming to, to light there. He had been responsible for John's death. Others may have believed that based on the similarities between them. After all, both, uh, both of them baptized people. Both of them preached basically the same message. You know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And at a time when there were no news cameras, televisions, you know, all that sort of stuff, it would have been fairly easy to get two men mixed up who had taught and who had practiced the same things. And so some people had confused them. 
Other people believe that Jesus was Elijah, and it's also easy to see why they might think that. God had said in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, in chapter 4 and verse 5, God has said, I will send you Elijah the prophet. That was a promise that God had made, and the people were looking for that day. They didn't recognize, as Jesus would tell the, uh, tell the apostles in the next chapter, in Matthew 17 and verse 12, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him. And of course, he was talking there about John the Baptist. Other people saw in Jesus the characteristics of, you know, the Old Testament prophets. Maybe Jeremiah is specifically mentioned here. And you can see some similarities. Both Jesus and Jeremiah strongly rebuked the wickedness of the people. They didn't, they didn't pull any punches. And both of them also were very grieved by the sins of the people. They weren't trying to be mean. They cared. And that may have given some the idea that Jesus was Jeremiah returned. And then there were some who really weren't sure who Jesus was, but they were convinced that he was a prophet. Maybe they didn't feel the necessity to identify him with one of the Old Testament prophets, but they, they couldn't help but see in Jesus some of the common characteristics of those men as revealed in the pages of the Old Testament. And, and so for all of the, the shortcomings of the apostles, of the men that Jesus chose to, to be with him, there's one thing you can, you can say about them, and that is that they recognized that Jesus was the Christ, and they held on to that belief. And they weren't carried away by public opinion. It wasn't, you know, what does the latest, you know, straw poll say about this? What, you know, what is the latest polling data on this? They weren't carried away by that, and, and they knew that there was no substitute for him. You know, that had been demonstrated earlier in John chapter 6 when all of those people turned and walked away in John 6, verse 66, where it says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And do you remember what Jesus said to the apostles at that point in time? In verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And I'll tell you what, it might have been easy at that point to say, You know what? Now's a pretty good time. Things are not going well, but they didn't. In fact, it's, it's Peter, verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We're not going anywhere. Peter said, and he, he uses words that indicate that it's not just him. It is, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed. He was speaking for the group there. And the reason it was so important for these men to understand whom it was they were following is because God's eternal purpose hinges on the identity of Jesus. Christianity is not really some just, you know, as long as you say the name Jesus periodically, it doesn't really matter what you think about him or anything like that, just as long as you use his name somehow and, and it's in a sort of favorable light. That's not it. God's eternal purpose hinges on the true identity of Jesus. His plan for mankind is grounded in the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. If he is not, all of this is a sham, plain and simple. Not everyone agrees about what Jesus meant when after his confess or Peter's confession, he responded in verse 18 by saying, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. One of the prevalent ideas in the religious world would associate Peter with that rock. And yet really even among those who you know, kind of connect those in one way or another, there's still really no agreement about you know, what those words really mean. There are some who believe that Peter is actually the rock itself. And they get that idea from the fact that the name Peter basically means a rock or really more accurately a stone, a small stone. Others think that Peter is being spoken to here by Jesus really more as a representative of all the apostles. You know, Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 that uh, he would compare Christians to a house that is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And so they see the, the apostles in general as the rock, the foundation upon which the church is built. But I would just go and tell you this morning, those, those views don't seem to do justice to the words of Jesus. 
if the Lord had wanted to indicate that Peter was the rock, why not just say that? You're, you're Peter, and, and on you I'm going to build my church. And, and as for this idea of the apostles being, the, you know, being spoken to and Peter just a representative of that, um, that they are the foundation. When, when Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, that, uh, that you know, we are being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. He's not talking about a foundation that consists of the apostles and prophets, but rather a foundation that has been laid down by the apostles and prophets. Because he would go on to say there in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, after mentioning that, he would talk about Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. That's really the foundation. And so when Jesus says, I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, let me tell you, what he was saying is that the church would be built upon the foundation of his own identity. The fact that he is the Christ, the fact that he is the son of the living God. And the reason Jesus was saying what he was saying here was not so that the apostles would have a better understanding of who Peter is, not so that they would have a better understanding of who they were, but rather so that they would have a better understanding of who Jesus is. That's what's going on here in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is trying to get it clear in their minds who he is, because if they are ever going to be the people who take the gospel into all creation, they're going to have to have that fixed in their mind. And be committed to it. Peter would later write some things that I think are similar in meaning that would point out the, the fact that the Old Testament even spoke of these matters. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2 for a moment. 1 Peter chapter 2. And let's look at verse 4 beginning. Peter says, As you come to him, to Christ, a living stone, Rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. It goes back to the Old Testament now. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, and he quotes another Old Testament passage, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do, Peter says. People won't listen to anyone else. Maybe they ought to just listen to Peter. Peter said, you want to know who the rock is? You know who the foundation of all of this is? The foundation is Jesus, Peter said. The passage I pointed out earlier where Paul talked about Christians being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. As I said, the foundation of the apostles and prophets is the foundation they laid down. It was by their preaching. They talked to people about Jesus the Christ, about him being the cornerstone, the foundation of it all. You know, the cornerstone, you know, we don't usually talk in those terms in our day, but the cornerstone was the the most important stone in the foundation. It was laid down first. It was that around which everything else was built. And Christ is that when it comes to the church. He is the cornerstone, the foundation of it all. And of course, that fits nicely with what Peter wrote on, on another, or what Paul rather wrote on, a, on another occasion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verses 10 and 11, Paul would say uh, to the Corinthians, that according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. But listen to what he says. Let each one take care how he builds on it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, same thing being talked about, not something different. And when you look at all of those passages, what do you think Jesus is trying to point out when he says to Peter, Peter, on, on this rock I will build my church. He is saying that his church would be built not on the strength of a man. That's not it. It would be built upon the stable foundation of his own identity. The church rests, if you will, on the unshakable foundation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we can't afford to forget that. But there's something else I want you to see in this chapter, and that is that there are some implications 
to recognizing the identity of Jesus. And you see that in the second section that we read from this morning, starting from verse 21 and going on to the end of the chapter. And so once the, the matter concerning the identity of Jesus had been cleared up and it was established, he is the Christ, he is the son of the living God, Jesus then began to tell the disciples what that meant. And, and what he says first in verse 21 is that from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. You know, Jesus had made allusions to his death and his resurrection prior to this. But when I look at what is said in the Gospels, it seems to me that this is the first time that he just opens up and pointedly tells the disciples, I'm going to die but I'm going to be raised from the dead. He'd made statements before that we know, because we have the, you know, the whole picture, that we know refer to his death and resurrection, but the apostles didn't understand what he was talking about at the time. And I'm not sure what the disciples had in mind when, when they said, you know, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same thing that many other Jews had in mind when they talked about the Christ and the expectations of what the Messiah would accomplish. If you were to ask any normal Jew in the first century whether or not they were looking for the coming of the Messiah, uh, yeah, they would have absolutely said yes. And they understood that, that the Messiah was the king. They knew that. But the kind of kingdom they had in mind was one very much that was a part of this world. They expected the Christ to come and they thought he would establish a great earthly kingdom. It would look much like the kingdom of David or the kingdom of Solomon. And in their way of thinking, what was going to happen is the, uh, is the Roman powers were going to be overthrown and Israel was going to once again take its place as one of the great nations of the world, the greatest of nations in the world. They certainly didn't associate their king with a cross. Those two things didn't go together in their minds. And we're not told, but I wouldn't be surprised if that is the kind of thing Peter had in mind when he took the Lord aside on this occasion and he began to rebuke him. You know, there were times when Peter had a hard time accepting things the Lord's way. Have you ever noticed that? If you remember, Jesus will later wash the disciples' feet the night before he is crucified. And, and at first, Peter didn't want anything to do with that. And I don't think he was being humble. I think he was recognizing, you know, the guy at the top doesn't wash feet. His mind was already made up. This is how it's supposed to be, and this is not how it's supposed to be. And I think that's the problem here as well. Peter already has his mind made up about how the Christ, the Son of the living God, and how this is supposed to turn out. But whatever the reason for Peter's response to Jesus, the Lord used it as an opportunity to teach the disciples an important lesson about discipleship, uh, some things that they needed to understand. And one thing he taught Peter and the rest of the disciples that they needed to learn is that disciples are not in the position to say, no, Lord. Those words don't go together. You can't call Jesus Lord and then reject what he says. It doesn't fit. Peter had made a great confession when he acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ, but he followed it with one of his great mistakes. It is inconsistent for a person to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then to turn around and try to tell him how to run his business. Again, no Lord. That's a contradiction in terms. When we say that Jesus is Lord, what we're saying is he is the master. And you don't get to tell the master no. The proper response is, speak, Lord, your servant hears. Command, I'll obey. And we might look at all of this and think, you know, how, how could Peter do that sort of thing? How, how could he do what he did on this occasion? And, and, and you, know, how, you know, we have we've not been guilty of that sort of thing. Certainly, we would never say, no, Lord. Maybe not the words. But have we ever been guilty of the, that attitude? It is remarkable to us that Peter could say such a thing. Unless maybe we take a good look at our own lives because we are pretty good sometimes at contradicting the master by the things we do, aren't we? We may not, we may not openly flaunt it, 
And again, we would, we would never dream of saying the words. But the truth is, we don't have to say them. Our attitudes, our actions, those speak way louder than words sometimes. But there's something else the disciples needed to learn, and that is that they needed to be ready to accept the cross. And by that, I mean both his and theirs. You see, not only was Jesus going to go to the cross, whether they understood it or not, they too were going to be given crosses to bear, whether they understood it or not. And Jesus was telling them something they didn't want to hear, but it was something they needed to hear. According to the Jewish mind, Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, Paul quotes it in Galatians 3, verse 13, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. End of the subject. Person who is hung on a tree, that person is cursed by God. And that's why Paul said that to preach Christ crucified, and in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23, he says that is a, quote, stumbling block to the Jews. The Lord was getting the disciples ready for the cross. He knew that it was contrary to the way they thought about things. And what he was telling them is what would happen so that when it came to pass, they wouldn't stumble. That's why he's teaching them these things. But again, it wasn't just his cross they were being prepared for. It was their own cross as well. In verse 24, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, if you're going to follow me, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would lose his life or save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Life's not going to be the way you've always planned it out, Jesus said. It's not always going to be set on your terms. In fact, everything's going to be kind of turned around. The way to save your life is going to be to lose it in my cause. That doesn't necessarily mean physical death. Sometimes it did. But it means his will comes before yours. It means when we evaluate how life is going to go, the, the, the first question that's going to be asked is not, what do I want? It's going to be, what does the master will? What Jesus was telling his disciples is that a true disciple is going to be like his master in all kinds of ways. But in this instance, if the master carries a cross, then so will the disciple. And if a person's not willing to carry a cross, they can't be a disciple. Let me ask, are we prepared for that? Are we willing to accept the terms of discipleship that was laid down by Jesus? Let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God. Are you convinced of that like Peter was? And if so, have you come to terms with what that means? Have you been saying, no, Lord, maybe again, not, not the words coming out of your mouth, but by the way that you've been living? Or have you decided to take up your cross and follow the one who died for you? That's the only way. That's the only way in the end to save your life. And the reason Jesus told us about these things is because that's exactly what he wants. His instruction comes from his love and it comes from his grace. So if we have anyone here this, this morning, we can help you in some way as you strive to follow Jesus. Maybe you're just beginning in that regard, just learning the things that you need to know about him. Let us help you with that. That's what we want to do. Maybe you've learned some things about Jesus and you've not yet put that into practice. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, for example. Why not, why not do that today? Or again, if you need to, if you need to look at those things, let us, let us sit down with you. Let us, let's open our Bibles together and let's talk about what the Lord says along those lines. Maybe you're someone who's done that at some point in the past, but you've been saying no, Lord, and living life on your terms. Why not take the opportunity you've been given this morning to make the changes you need to make so that you can truly be a disciple of Jesus, so that you can follow the master? And if we can help you in some way, whatever that might be, we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing.